Christmas night, Boaz, Alabama, 1992. 37-year-old Peggy Reeves Mock walks out of the home she shares with her mother to go out and celebrate with friends. She never makes it back, and the mystery of her disappearance baffles investigators. Three months later, various personal items belonging to Peggy are found scattered around the burned-out remnants of a once-popular club. They are the first solid pieces of evidence detectives have to work with. Two months after that, Peggy's missing car is found backed into a parking space at a local apartment complex less than a mile from where she was last seen. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints. Years later, police receive a disturbing letter. In it, the author discusses her concerns about Peggy's disappearance and makes the claim that the 37-year-old had been killed and her body taken to Texas. When investigators track down the writer, they make a bizarre discovery. Not long after scribing the letter, she herself became the victim of a violent and brutal homicide. Was Peggy Mock the victim of a random act of violence carried out by someone she had just met? Was her disappearance in some way linked to the murder of the letter writer? Or was Peggy specifically targeted and taken not in a random act, but perhaps by someone she knew and trusted? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 203, The Vanishing of Peggy Reeves Mott. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious 1992 vanishing of 37-year-old Peggy Reeves Mock. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Over the course of the past few years, the number of emails and messages I've received asking me to cover this case has been growing rapidly. Digging into the investigation, it became clear why. There's very little information available, and that only makes the mysterious circumstances of Peggy's disappearance all the more disturbing and haunting. This is episode 203. The Vanishing of Peggy Reeves Mock. In the early months of 1960, successful businessman John Bradford traded in the dry heat of Arizona, moving 2,000 miles to Alabama. Settling in Gadsden, Bradford erected a large mansion overlooking the Coosa River, just north of Southside and straddling the borders between Gadsden and Rainbow City. Bradford had found success working in munitions and ultimately opened a small factory in town, manufacturing detonators for the United States Army. Over the course of the next decade, as the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War escalated, the factory became larger, hiring on more employees and generating higher profits. When Bradford's move had succeeded beyond his expectations, not everything was going exactly according to plan. In early August of 1970, four armed men, masked, waged an assault against Bradford's personal security and gained entry to the industrialist's home. In the midst of the robbery, which saw the men grabbing expensive jewelry and furs, a shootout took place, leaving Bradford with a non-life-threatening wound. The four men chained members of the family up inside the house, along with two law enforcement officers, and left with a security guard as a hostage. Not long after making their escape, the four would engage in a second gun battle with state and local law enforcement. Two of them were injured, and all four were arrested and charged. Following this harrowing experience, Bradford decided that perhaps his mountaintop mansion wasn't the best place to raise a family, and so he vacated the premises, selling off the property. Not long after Bradford's exodus, the home, once known as the Old Bradford Mansion, would be transformed into a club and gathering spot for the community's wealthy and elite. Renamed the Mountaintop Club, many prominent citizens attended parties and gatherings on the sprawling property with picturesque views of the river. While the club was extremely popular, by the end of the 70s, it had already begun to fade as new clubs, bars, and lounges popped up throughout the town. In the early 1980s, 
The once thriving hotspot was little more than an out of the way, abandoned and decaying structure that became a gathering place for local teens. Windows were shattered, various symbols and phrases were spray painted over the edifice, and the built in pool, once filled with crystal clear water, had become little more than a murky pond of debris and refuse. For many of the local youth, it was a good spot to get together and hang out, especially when you didn't necessarily want anyone to know what you were up to. Whether it was drinking with buddies or a secluded spot to take a date for some private time, the old mansion never really lost its pull. That all changed in February of 1985 when a massive fire broke out, swallowing up the mountaintop club. By the time the fire departments of Gadsden and Rainbow City showed up, the building was so engulfed that the decision was made to allow the fire to burn itself out. The next morning, little remained outside of smoldering ashes and graying cinders as firefighters sprayed down the blackened remnants of the building, dark streams rushing off into the already cloudy waters of the pool. For the next few years, the wilderness would conduct its magic. Grass and weeds, bushes began spreading out, swallowing the blackened rubble. For the most part, it fell off the map. While teens continued to hang out there from time to time, the once popular spot began to fade out like the ghost of a memory long since forgotten. That is exactly as it would remain for the next eight years, until one quiet, cool Thursday morning in March of 1993 when a local man stumbled upon the first clue in a disappearance that had baffled investigators. Four months earlier in December of 1992, 37-year-old Peggy Reeves Mock had mysteriously vanished. After spending Christmas morning with her family, Peggy decided to meet up with friends at a local lounge in downtown Gadsden. She never made it home, and while police had been searching for both the missing woman and her car, they hadn't found a single trace of either until Peggy's purse and driver's license turned up in a pile of weeds beside the old sludge-filled pool of the former mountaintop club, just miles from where the 37-year-old had last been seen. For the first time since they'd taken the missing persons report, detectives now had a break in a case that up until that point had felt like chasing a phantom in the dark. Peggy Gail Reeves was born on Monday, May 2nd, 1955 in Etowah County, Alabama to parents Charles and Naomi. Peggy was the family's second-born child with her having a sister three years her senior. She would grow up in Etowah County, living in Gadsden and surrounding areas for the vast majority of her life. Unfortunately, there is almost no information available about the bulk of Peggy's life. From the announcement of her birth to the reports of her disappearance, there are few, if any, details left covered. Despite exhaustive attempts to track down information and locate relatives, much of Peggy's life remains a mystery for which the answers cannot be easily found. We know that Peggy attended Litchfield Baptist Church with her parents who were devout Christians. Her father, a World War II veteran, was involved in the local community and worked for the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing Company, which specialized in producing farm equipment. It wasn't a luxurious lifestyle for the Reeves family as money could often be tight, but the family fought together. And when things were good, they lived it up. And when things were bad, they drew tighter and were determined to make it through together. What little we do know of Peggy's past, it's been made quite clear. She was a sharp woman who knew the value of family and of a hard day's work. Sadly, tragedy would strike the Reeves family on what is supposed to be a day to celebrate love. On February 14th, 1986, Charles Reeves passed away at the age of 63. His death was a massive blow to the family, with several people commenting on how close and supportive they all were. By the time of Charles' passing, Peggy and her sister were in their early 30s. While Peggy hadn't yet begun a family, her older sister had and was living 30 miles away in the town of Douglas with her husband and child. Around this time, Peggy grew closer to her mother as she took it upon herself to be her primary support, looking after her and helping around the house and with errands. Following the death of her father, Peggy once again seemingly drops off the face of the earth at that point. She doesn't re-emerge until the winter of 1992 when she's listed as living with her mother in a small home in the city of Boas, located approximately 20 miles northwest of Gadsden and just 10 miles north of her sister in Douglas. 
public record show that Naomi left Gadsden in 1990, four years after Charles' death, moving to Boaz and was seemingly followed by her daughter. Curiously, at this point in time, Peggy's name changes to Peggy Reeves Mock. This would suggest she had been married at some point in time, though no record of a wedding or any mention of a husband or ex-husband could be located. So that is going to move us all the way forward to Christmas morning, 1992. According to the Gadsden Times, Peggy lived with her mother in a small home on Brown Street, which ran for two and a half miles north to south, parallel to U.S. Route 431, just west of downtown. Christmas fell on a Friday in 1992, and Peggy had made plans. She would spend the majority of the day at home, celebrating with her mother and speaking with family. Then, after dinner, she'd arranged to make the 20-minute drive into Gadsden to hit a few local bars and lounges with friends. According to her mother, everything went well throughout the early part of the day, and there were no indications of Peggy being worried about anyone or anything. Between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., Peggy got ready for her night out. Dressing casually in a plain white shirt, blue jeans, and white boots, the petite woman brushed back her strawberry blonde hair, allowing a small wave to sweep down along the left edge of her forehead. Grabbing her keys, Peggy kissed her mother on the cheek and told her that she'd be back late, so she shouldn't wait up. Grabbing her purse, the 37-year-old pulled the door shut behind her and climbed into her dark blue 1983 Toyota Celica. Waving as she backed out of the driveway, Naomi had no way of knowing this would be the last time she'd ever see her daughter alive. According to official reports, Peggy's destination that night was Chestnut Station, a popular bar that had opened in the mid-80s and often featured live music. Still popular today, the bar is located at 410 Chestnut Street in Gadsden, just a few blocks west of the Coosa River. Naomi went to bed that night believing that Peggy would be there when she woke in the morning, but to her surprise, she found the house empty on December 26th. Not only was Peggy not there, neither was her car. It seemed strange to Naomi that she hadn't heard from her daughter. She was an adult and was free to come and go as she pleased, but it was very out of the ordinary for her to do so without letting anyone know. According to Naomi, Peggy had stayed away for a few days at a time here and there, but she always told her about her plans. Assuming that maybe Peggy had gone home to spend the night at a friend's place, Naomi didn't immediately panic. However, as the day continued on, she couldn't continue to suppress the growing sense of dread in her gut. Hoping to find a quick and simple answer, Naomi began calling relatives and friends asking whether or not they knew where Peggy was. A few people relayed that they'd seen her at Chestnut Station the night before, but no one knew where she'd gone after that. At the same time, no one was exactly worried either. Peggy had a good head on her shoulders and she'd probably just fallen asleep and forgotten a call but they assured Naomi she'd hear from her daughter sooner than later. As the hours passed, though, the phone remained silent. The only calls coming in were from friends and family who were wondering if Peggy had made contact yet. With each new call greeted by the same solemn answer, concern for Peggy's safety was growing rapidly. Of course, though, no one assumed the worst yet. Maybe she'd had car trouble and was waiting on a tow truck, Perhaps she'd had a little too much to drink and decided to grab a quick nap in her car or at a downtown motel. The problem was, no one knew anything for certain. So while others tried to put the pieces together, Naomi and other members of the family started searching. Making their way towards Gadsden, they took the route they figured Peggy would have been most likely to have used, thinking that they might see her or her car on the side of the road. By the time they arrived in the city, they hadn't come upon a trace of the 37-year-old. Pulling into the parking lot at Chestnut Station, they found it empty. No signs of Peggy or her Toyota Celica. Without knowing where else Peggy may have gone that night or what other plans she could have had, there was little that could be done outside of driving up and down the main streets, then lesser-traveled roads, and finally, rural dirt roads that cut through the country. It was a fruitless effort as they couldn't find any signs of Peggy or the car. Several days after Peggy was last seen, her family decided to notify the police. Since she was living in Boas at the time, the Boas Police Department took the missing persons report, with Captain Harvey Moore personally getting involved and leading the investigation. 
They didn't have much to go on, so they quickly entered Peggy's information and her vehicle's information into law enforcement computer systems and began sending teletype messages to police departments throughout the state. They soon expanded, notifying law enforcement in five surrounding states to be on the lookout for Peggy and her car. Unfortunately, none of this led to the discovery of any additional information. In hopes that someone at the bar that night might have seen Peggy, who she was with, and when she left, the Boaz police got in touch with the Gadsden police, bringing them into the investigation since technically Chestnut Station was in their jurisdiction. Detectives were quickly assigned to begin tracking down the names of anyone who had been at the bar that night, starting with Peggy's friends, to try and construct a timeline of events. Investigators found several people who had been there and had seen Peggy. According to their statements, everything seemed to be going fine. Peggy was having a good time, she didn't appear to be under any duress, and there were no reports of anyone hassling her, giving her issues, or hitting on her aggressively. While there wasn't a lot of helpful information to be gleaned, detectives did discover one tidbit that was previously unknown. Reportedly, after hanging around Chestnut Station for a while, Peggy had decided to visit another local bar, the War Horse Lounge. Located just off George Wallace Drive at 108 East Chestnut Street, the War Horse was less than one mile east of Chestnut Station across the Coosa River via East Broad Street. Following up on this new lead, detectives proceeded on to the War Horse, where they had hoped to interview staff and gather up any information about who was present in the bar that night. Several people remembered Peggy from Christmas night and told police that they had seen her speaking with an unknown man with whom she would later leave the bar. Ultimately, investigators managed to track down the man, and according to their reports, he was cooperative and helpful. This man, who has never been publicly identified, told detectives that it was true. Peggy had left the bar with him that night, but he'd brought her back, dropping her off in the parking lot. The details of what exactly occurred between Peggy and this man have never been revealed by investigators. However, there have been many who have questioned the veracity of his story. Regardless, though, detectives had no evidence or additional information to link the man to any potential crime against the missing 37-year-old. Gadsden Detective Lieutenant Roger Bohannon explained the situation to the Gadsden Times, noting that at the time, they had no reason to question this man's story. Bohannon stated that the man dropped Peggy back off at the lounge, saying, quote, when he left her, she was all right, end quote. This is frequently noted as being the last time Peggy was seen, with the unknown man stating that he dropped her off between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. While details are somewhat vague, it does seem that at least one other witness saw Peggy in the vicinity of the bar after that man dropped her off. Where she had gone from there, though, was unknown. Unfortunately, investigators found themselves facing a dead end. While they were able to expand on the timeline and could follow Peggy up until around midnight, they didn't have anywhere to go after that. None of Peggy's friends had reported seeing her after midnight, and while they didn't have a lot of witnesses, those they did have offered conflicting information. Just as someone claimed to have last seen Peggy near the war horse, Others stated that they saw her back at Chestnut Station in the minutes leading up to midnight, which is why even official missing persons listings for Peggy don't agree on the details. While official sources such as NamUs and the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency state that Peggy was last seen in Guntersville, the Charlie Project and missing persons flyers specify that she was last seen in Gasden. For the record, Guntersville is approximately 40 miles northwest of the War Horse Lounge, and I've not found a single report listing any sightings of Peggy in that area the night she vanished. Though I did reach out to find out why there is this confusing mention of Guntersville, no agency provided an answer. As the calendar flipped over from December of 92 to January of 93, the press for information began expanding. Missing persons flyers and large posters showing images of Peggy and her car were put up all over the state, leading to a slew of tips called in to different agencies investigating the case. Boas Police Department Captain Harvey Moore explained to the Gadsden Times, saying, quote, I must have followed up on at least 50 leads so far, end quote. As with all cases, the bigger the investigation grew, the more tips they received, but most of what they were given could be classified only as rumor and speculation. One particularly alluring rumor began picking up speed, 
and alleged that Peggy had been forcibly taken to Texas where she became the victim of a crime. In hopes of finding whether or not there was any truth to it, Captain Moore teletyped Texas law enforcement agencies seeking information about any crimes which involved someone fitting Peggy's description. Not surprisingly, there were none. January would come to an end with investigators no closer to finding Peggy or her Toyota Celica. February would come and go much the same with no new developments or leads. The case was growing cold, and while multiple departments were involved, the necessity to investigate more recent crimes resulted in Peggy's case being worked on only when other more urgent matters were settled. All of that would change, though, in March of 1993, when the first major pieces of evidence in the case were discovered by pure happenstance. On the morning of Thursday, March 25th, a local man and his younger son were out exploring the area around the burned-out mountaintop club when they came upon a purse lying in the parking lot. Opening the bag, the man found Peggy's driver's license inside. Recognizing her name from the news reports about her disappearance, the man quickly contacted the Rainbow City Police Department, which held jurisdiction in that area, and notified them of the discovery. Rainbow City investigators quickly notified both Boas and Gadsden authorities, as well as the Etowah County Sheriff's Department. Law enforcement would later report that inside of the purse, they had found Peggy's license, prescription bottles with her name on them, and a pair of underwear. Captain Moore told the Times that it appeared that the purse had been rifled through, probably for money, as no cash was found inside the bag. As with so much of this case, there appeared to be some confusion surrounding where exactly the purse had been found. Investigators would quickly discover that while the purse had been found by the man and his son in the parking lot, they were not the first people to locate the item. Reportedly, a student at nearby Southside High School had gone up to the burned-out club to take photographs when he stumbled upon the purse lying in the weeds, not far from the murky, sludge-filled pool. According to the student, after finding the purse, he picked it up from its spot and carried it with him as he looked through it for anything of value or interest. Finding nothing worth keeping, the teen tossed the purse down in the parking lot where it was later found. Now, here is where the details become contradictory once again. Upon initially examining the purse, investigators felt that it hadn't been out in the open for three months, the three months that Peggy had been missing. Based on the condition of the purse, and the fact that there had been heavy snowfall in the recent weeks, detectives argue that the purse may have been dumped at that location in the weeks leading up to its discovery. However, their opinions would dramatically shift just a few days later. During questioning, the high school student who had initially found the purse told authorities that when he had first come upon it, it appeared to have been lying there for quite some time as weeds had begun growing over top of it. Investigators stated it was possible the bag had been lying there since the night of Peggy's disappearance, going on to describe the purse as hard and stiff, while the items inside appeared to have been weather-worn. Considering that the bag had originally been found within close proximity to the pool, not the parking lot, on Friday, March 26th, detectives had the black waters drained. Unfortunately, when the water was all gone, they found nothing but debris and mud at the bottom. Hoping that somewhere in the area there might be more clues to assist them in their investigation, detectives organized a large-scale search of the area. The Gadsden police were joined by members of the Boas Police, Rainbow City Police, Etowah County Sheriff's Department, the Etowah Rescue Squad, and the Rainbow City Fire Department. Approximately 30 people were involved in canvassing the area around the Burned Down Club over the weekend of the 27th and 28th. While the vast majority of searchers covered terrain in a gridded search, Etowah Chief Deputy Kirby Johnston and Rainbow City Chief Deputy Jeff Harwood took to the sky searching from a low-flying plane. A large portion of their search was conducted by flying low over the Coosa River due to its close proximity to the burned-out club. At that time of year, the waters were clear enough for them to see nearly to the bottom. While detectives on the ground searched for pieces of evidence, the two chief deputies were looking for Peggy's car. The air search would ultimately fail to deliver any results. However, those working on the ground would have greater success. Not far from where the high school student had originally found the purse, searchers came across a white boot 
fitting the description of the ones worn by Peggy the night she vanished. Not too much further away, they found the other boot, bagging the items as evidence. They didn't yet know whether or not the boots were connected to Peggy's disappearance, but her family would later confirm the boots, purse, and underwear found did belong to the missing woman. After these discoveries, authorities brought in a cadaver dog to go over the area, but the dog didn't appear to pick up on the scent of decomposition anywhere around. At the conclusion of the search, Captain Moore reported to the media that all items were going to be sent to the state forensic lab for examination. In addition to looking for any trace evidence left behind, detectives hoped the lab could narrow down exactly how long they believed the items had been left out in the weeds. Asked about progression on the investigation outside of the search, Captain Moore told the Gadsden Times, quote, We have some leads we are tracking down, but I can't speculate on that part of the investigation. We still have a missing person, but we are looking for any kind of piece of evidence that may have gotten thrown away and went under the vines and stuff. End quote. While the search had provided investigators with new evidence, none of what was found gave them a real direction to follow. While they had listed Peggy as a missing person, detectives noted that where the items were found and the condition they were in left them believing there was a high likelihood that foul play was involved. In hopes of drumming up more tips, Peggy's family announced that they would be providing a $1,000 reward for information on Peggy, her whereabouts, or the items found at Mountaintop. While the reward and new evidence had seemingly reinvigorated the case, letting detectives feel like they were finally making some headway, the investigation began fizzling just a few weeks later. Once again, they faced the same issues. No solid leads, no suspects, nowhere else to go. One month later, in late April, the Etowah County Sheriff's Department conducted another more extensive search of the Coosa River in the area surrounding Mountaintop. This second search was executed following a call from a local fisherman who had retrieved a strange bag from the water in an area near Mountaintop and thought maybe it was connected to the disappearance. Despite a large squad of searchers flying over and going down into the river, no additional evidence was found. And if what was discovered back then was in any way connected to Peggy, authorities have never confirmed. While April would ultimately conclude with no new information, May would kick off with a major discovery. On Tuesday, May 11th, Peggy's missing car was finally found. The vehicle, a dark blue 1983 Toyota Celica, had been found backed into a parking space at the former Forest River Apartments, less than one mile south of the Warhorse Lounge along George Wallace Drive. According to reports of the time, investigators noted their belief that the vehicle had been parked there for quite some time, and more than likely, since the night Peggy disappeared. While Gadsden was in Etowah County, Peggy's car had a license plate bearing the insignia of Calhoun County. It was for this reason detectives theorized that whoever left the car at the apartment complex had backed it in, because a different county plate would have stood out to people living in that area. While the discovery of the car was thought to be the next big break in the case, in the end, it would only lead to more frustration. Few details were released about the condition of the car or anything found within it. However, Detectives did tell the Gadsden Times that no evidence connected to their investigation was found in or on the vehicle. In addition, despite going over the vehicle with a fine-tooth comb, forensic examiners were unable to locate a single fingerprint. It seemed apparent that whoever had driven the car to the spot where it was later found had taken the time to wipe down the entire interior and exterior of the vehicle, Sadly, as always seems to be the situation with this investigation, despite finding the car, Peggy's case began growing cold once again. In mid-October, some 10 months after Peggy's disappearance, the community began growing concerned about the possibility that there might be a serial killer on the loose. This theory came to the forefront after a local news station reported on Peggy's case, as well as the cases of two other women, Felicia Renee Dry who disappeared from Albertsville in June of 93, and Kathy Hunt, who had last been seen in Guntersville in late July of the same year. Law enforcement all across the state received phone calls about the potential connections between the cases, so much so 
that Albertville Police Chief Randy Amos called a press conference to address the spreading rumor. Chief Amos explained that the agencies involved in the three cases had compared details of the crimes and information about their investigations and had found no areas in which there was overlap or commonalities. Amos went on to state that since none of the women had been located, they couldn't even be sure that harm had come to them, and without bodies, how could they possibly make any connection to a potential serial killer? They had no solid physical evidence to compare, and what evidence they did have showed no links between the three cases. Amos told the Birmingham Post-Herald he did not think the cases were connected, nor did he believe a serial killer was stalking the state, saying, quote, We certainly don't want people in our area to be afraid to go out in the streets, end quote. As it would turn out, Chief Amos was right. Less than two weeks later, Kathy Hunt contacted family members stating that she was alive and well and had no idea that she had been reported missing. While things had turned out positively for Kathy, Felicia Dry would not be as lucky. In November of 1995, more than two years after disappearing, hikers searching for a safe place to camp discovered Felicia's wrecked car off Highway 431 near Mountain Borough. Her body was inside, and investigators would ultimately determine she had died after losing control of her vehicle and careening down an embankment. She was just 19 years old. December of 1993 marked one year since Peggy had vanished, and despite all of their efforts, police were nowhere close to finding her or the person responsible for her disappearance. In what I can only describe as a rare interview, Peggy's mother, Naomi, sat down with the Gadsden Times to discuss the difficulty in searching for her daughter and her own beliefs on what may have happened. Naomi went on to express her belief that Peggy was likely deceased, explaining that if she had the ability to contact her family, she'd have done so by now. Naomi went on to explain that she had an overwhelming feeling, one she couldn't deny, that led her to believe that Peggy was gone the very night she disappeared. She'd also had a dream where she'd seen her late husband, Charles, walking down the street side by side with Peggy, which strengthened her belief. She explained, quote, I just felt the Lord showed me where she's at, end quote. While Naomi was of the belief that Peggy was gone, she noted that her other daughter firmly believed her sister was alive and was working hard to try and keep her name in the media and her story going. Asked her thoughts on the investigation, Naomi spoke highly of the Boas police, especially Captain Moore. She described Moore as absolutely wonderful and said detectives had done everything they could to try and solve the case. Naomi tried to find some sense of comfort in knowing that police had at least found some clothing in the car, explaining, quote, If you watch the news, you see cases where they never find out anything. I'm not alone. There are so many young children missing. You always think you're hurt the worst, but I know there are worse things. End quote. Once again, Peggy's case would grow cold. The last pieces of information available about the investigation, the last discussion of any updates or leads, would come in the fall of 1995, nearly three years since the disappearance. In November of that year, Lieutenant Bohannon sat down for an interview with the Gadsden Times to discuss the status. This interview was the first time anyone associated with the case discussed a letter investigators had received in which Peggy was mentioned. A woman named Judy K. Lumpkin, wrote a letter to an unnamed third party who eventually turned that letter over to authorities. In this letter, which has never been fully released, Lumpkin wrote that she had, quote, been sick since Peggy Mott came up missing, end quote. Lumpkin claimed in the letter that Peggy had visited her at some point in time, though the nature of their relationship is unknown. Towards the end of the letter, Lumpkin wrote, quote, Peggy went to Texas in the trunk of a car, end quote. Unfortunately, by the time this letter came to the attention of police, they weren't able to follow up with Miss Lumpkin as on November 18th, 1994, the 43-year-old was found dead, the victim of a brutal murder in which she had been beaten to death. Not far from where Lumpkin was found, there was another body, that of 35-year-old Michael Estill. 
He had been killed in a similar manner, and considering the close proximity of the bodies, investigators believed both victims had been killed by the same assailant. Ultimately, two men would turn themselves in for the crime. 19-year-old James Moore surrendered to authorities after calling from a payphone and discussing his involvement in the crimes. 34-year-old James Ellis would also turn himself in, surrendering to authorities in Dade County, Florida, before being extradited back to Alabama. Ellis would go on to plead guilty for his part in the murders, receiving a sentence of life in prison. Moore would go to trial and would be found guilty of capital murder, receiving a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. While investigators were able to solve the double murder, the investigation did little to aid them when it came to finding out what had happened to Peggy. No connection between Peggy and Lumpkin was ever established, at least not one which has been shared publicly. And whether or not the claims in her letter are based in reality and fact or her own concerns about the crime itself, there's really no way of knowing. Many have noted the fascinating link between Lumpkin's claim and early rumors that Peggy was taken to Texas where she became the victim of a crime. Unfortunately, investigators have never managed to find anything which can shed light on Lumpkin's letter. At first, there was consideration that perhaps Lumpkin had been killed because of the letter she'd written or for talking about Peggy. There was a strong push to try and figure out if James Moore or James Ellis could have been involved in Peggy's disappearance. As of this time, no solid evidence was ever found connecting them to the crime, and the murders of both Lumpkin and Estelle appear to have been random, driven by alcohol-fueled violence. Sadly, for the last 27 years, the case has been quiet. No additional information, no new leads, nothing. This December will mark 30 years that Peggy has been missing, but law enforcement does not appear to be any closer to finding Peggy or the person responsible. When last seen, Peggy Reeves Mock was described as being a white female with strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes, standing 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighing approximately 115 pounds. Peggy left the home she shared with her mother on Brown Street in Boaz on the evening of December 25th, 1992. Her mother described Peggy as being dressed in a white shirt, blue jeans, and white boots. Those boots were later recovered, along with Peggy's purse and some personal effects near the burned-out location of the former Mountaintop Club. Peggy was driving a dark blue 1983 Toyota Celica with a Calhoun County license plate. The vehicle was found six months after her disappearance, backed into a parking space at the former Forest River Apartments, known today as the Summer Waters Apartment Homes. The vehicle had been completely wiped clean of fingerprints and no evidence of value was recovered. The apartment complex was just shy of one mile south of the Warhorse Lounge along George Wallace Drive. Official reports state that Peggy was last seen either outside of the Warhorse or a mile away outside of Chestnut Station. Yet other reports claim Peggy's vehicle was spotted north of Boaz in DeKalb County, the night of her disappearance, although this has never been confirmed. At the time of her disappearance, Peggy Reeves Mock was 37 years old. While many believe Peggy became the victim of foul play and likely was killed the night she vanished, others continued to hope that she's still out there somewhere, trying to make it home. Indeed, if Peggy were alive today, she would have turned 67 years old in May. Officially, Peggy has been missing for nearly as long as she was known to have been alive. One final note here. Many official reports make the claim that Peggy may be in the Jacksonville, Florida area. There's been no explanation as to why this is stated. Nothing in the case talks about Florida. No evidence seems to connect to anywhere outside of Alabama. The only potential answer I could drum up on this while conducting background checks and genealogical research, I did find several listings of a Peggy Mock living in Jacksonville. However, this is clearly a different woman as the Florida Peggy is a real estate agent and her listings are all over the local newspapers and have been for years. Whether this mention of Florida is due to a conflict with this other person or if investigators have something solid leading them to believe this, I couldn't confirm. On a quiet Christmas night in 1992, Peggy Reeves Mock went out to meet with friends, have a few drinks, and celebrate. She never made it home, 
And 30 years later, the mystery of what became of Peggy continued to endure due both to a lack of case development and an utter absence of solid, dependable evidence. While her family fought to find her, to keep her name alive, they too have since passed on. Her mother, Naomi, passed in January of 2008 at the age of 84. Her older sister passed 12 years later in January of 2020. She was 67 years old. Three long decades have gone, and for more than half of that time, nothing new has been found. Peggy's case has grown extremely cold, but the answers are still out there, waiting to be discovered. On Christmas night in 1992, 37-year-old Peggy Reeves Mock left her home in Boaz and made the 20-minute drive to Gadsden to get together with friends, have a few drinks, and celebrate the holiday season. Despite multiple witnesses seeing her at Chestnut Station and later the Warhorse Lounge, no one has ever been found who claimed to have seen the missing woman after midnight. The last sightings place her in the vicinity of the Warhorse or possibly Chestnut Station, depending on who you ask between the hours of 11 and midnight. Three months later, in March of 93, Peggy's purse, license, prescription bottles, underwear, and boots are found dumped in the rural area surrounding the burned-out remnants of the old mountaintop club at Bradford's mansion. The condition of the item suggests they've been there since around the time of Peggy's disappearance, leading many to wonder if the 37-year-old had gone there willingly with someone, or perhaps was forcibly taken there, or... Maybe Peggy was never there, and it was merely the location in which her assailant chose to dump the items. Two months after that, Peggy's car is found backed into a parking space at the former Forest River Apartments, less than a mile south of the Warhorse. According to detectives, the vehicle appeared to have been there for some time, likely since Peggy vanished. No physical evidence was retrieved from the vehicle, and the crime lab concluded that someone had wiped the car down, inside and out, removing all fingerprints. Despite the discovery of the car, the clothes, and the purse, none of these items give investigators what they need to narrow their suspect pool or find a direction to look in. 30 years later, it appears the state of the case hasn't changed all that much. The known details have remained the same, no named suspects or persons of interest, no solid theories about what may have happened. For years, the debate about the assailant has been the same. Was this someone Peggy met randomly that night who she was either going along with and things turned out bad or who abducted her with the full intention of making her disappear? Given the utter lack of real helpful evidence, the possibilities are almost endless, which makes it all the more frustrating. Since we don't have a great deal of information about the crime, the circumstances, or really Peggy's life leading up to her disappearance, we can only work with what we do know. So we start at the beginning. On December 25th, 1992, Peggy leaves the home she shares with her mother and heads to Gadsden. She parks at Chestnut Station, a popular bar with live music that opened nearly a decade earlier. We know Peggy made it there. Friends and other patrons tell police she was there that night. Where everything goes off the rails is when Peggy decides to drive a mile down the road to the Warhorse Lounge. Here, we get a bizarre story. Several witnesses tell police they saw Peggy leave with an unnamed man. When investigators track him down, he explains that yes, Peggy left the lounge with him that night, but he dropped her back off at the Warhorse. While this certainly sounds suspicious given what we know about that night, it seems like police found at least one other person who confirmed spotting Peggy at the lounge after she was dropped off. Adding to the confusion are statements from other witnesses, who claim they saw Peggy at Chestnut Station around this same time. So, it's possible Peggy was dropped off and drove back to Chestnut Station, but it's also worth noting that almost all of the witnesses that night were drinking and partying themselves, so how reliable their memories are is unknown. All we can say for certain is, no one remembers seeing Peggy after midnight. We have no reports about what condition she was in that night either. Had she been drinking? If so, how much? Was she sober, a little buzzed, trashed? These are important details that have never been revealed if indeed they are known. What about the guy who says he dropped her off that night? Has he steered clear of trouble with the law in the years since, or did he know Peggy, or had they just met? Where exactly did they go that night when they left the warhorse together for such a short period of time? Unfortunately, 
we don't have the answers to these extremely pertinent questions. So we move forward to the next so-called break in the case, the discovery of her purse. Now, I think it's worth noting that the location of the old mountaintop club is approximately six miles south of the Warhorse, and yes, the most direct route would involve driving down George Wallace Drive, passing the Forest River Apartments. All told, the drive should have taken no more than 15 minutes, especially considering there likely wasn't a lot of heavy traffic late night on Christmas. Many have theorized that perhaps Peggy had gone willingly to that location, perhaps in the company of another person, and that's where things went south. Either the person who went along with Peggy turned on her, or she ran into someone up there who was out looking for trouble. Either way, if indeed Peggy was there that night, it seems quite clear that something went wrong. Some believe Peggy went up there to hook up and at some point changed her mind, and the assailant wouldn't take no for an answer, assaulting her and eventually killing her. Others think it's possible Peggy was in bad shape, either from drinking or perhaps something else, and that the suspect took her up there to assault her knowing it was a remote area and few others would be around. Either way, we know that Peggy's purse and some of her clothes ended up at that spot. This suggests that the killer was aware of that location, which many see as proof that the assailant was someone local or at least someone familiar with the area. Someone simply passing through likely wouldn't have known about the burned-out club south of downtown. However, if Peggy took the person there, then it's entirely possible that he didn't need to know about it. Driving back, he easily could have just pulled into the apartment complex they had passed, backed the car in, wiped it down, and walked away. He'd have been less than a mile south of the Warhorse at that time, and if he'd left a car there, all he had to do was walk back and drive off. However, the car tells somewhat of a different story. The sheer fact that the suspect took the time to wipe down every inch of it inside and out leads many to believe that this guy is either in the system and knew he'd be caught quick, or he is someone from the area who knew that police would at some point in time come looking to talk to him. With how little we know, it's hard to debate the finer points of this case, but given the option between someone simply passing through and someone who was from the area or lived nearby, it just seems like whoever this was had a knowledge and consciousness of Gadsden that a fresh face passing through probably wouldn't. Backing the car in was clearly an attempt to delay its discovery, and for that part, it worked. Peggy's car had a Calhoun County license plate, something that stood out to people living in Etowah County. How many people living in an apartment complex aren't going to notice a car sitting there for months with a plate from a different county? I mean, honestly, it's surprising to me that the car sat there as long as it did anyway without anyone noticing. It seems like that's the kind of thing that stands out, a car that never moves from its spot. This, however, may also speak volumes about how poorly this case was covered in the local media. A dark blue Toyota Celica sits in a parking lot less than a mile from where its owner was last seen for months and nobody notices? To me, the fact that the car was wiped down suggests that whoever was involved is not stupid. They know how to cover their tracks and this is likely not the first crime they've committed. That's not to say that this is some evil genius or serial killer with a long list of victims. More likely, it's someone with law enforcement experience, either from having worked with law enforcement or from having been in the custody of law enforcement. At the same time, maybe it's just someone who's seen a lot of movies and figured wiping the car down was the best choice. Think about that for a moment, though. Wiping down every inch of that car would not have been a quick job. And yet this person felt comfortable enough to take the time to do it. Was this done in the apartment complex parking lot or perhaps somewhere else? Since investigators have said they found no additional evidence in or on the car, this suggests that they didn't find any traces of blood or other bodily fluids. That would imply whatever happened to Peggy occurred outside of the car. And outside of wrapping her body extremely well, there's a good chance her car was not used to transport her body. Since we've got the purse and clothes at Mountaintop, and then the car a few miles away, there's a good chance Peggy could be anywhere between those two points. We also have to consider that the killer likely had his own vehicle and possibly could have transported Peggy's remains in that. But logistically, that would have either required one more person or for the killer to dump the car off, go back to his own vehicle, and then drive back up to wherever he had left her body. 
There are a lot of rural areas, wooded areas, remote places surrounding the old mountaintop club where a body is unlikely to be found, especially if the killer took the time to properly conceal it. That seems to be the case as Peggy's body has never been found. It clearly wasn't just left out in the open somewhere where anyone could stumble across it. To me, if you look through that whole area, the most likely place to dispose of a body would have been in the Kuza River. This is an area where it twists around a large outcropping of land before splitting into different forks. For the record, the Kuza River begins in Georgia and runs approximately 280 miles southwest, coming to a stop just northeast of Alabama's capital. Along the river, there are multiple hydroelectric dams which have been installed by Alabama Power. While searches of the river have been conducted, it seems they always focused in the area surrounding Mountaintop, but not so much elsewhere. There are several bridges in the area where someone could have dropped a body straight down into the wider and deeper parts of the river. Assuming the body was weighed down properly, it might not have traveled too far either. Perhaps that's why Peggy has never been found, nor have any bodies pulled from those dams been a match to her. Of course, after 30 years, there may not be much left to find, especially if she's in the water. Really, the last piece of information we're left to try and decipher is the letter written by Judy Lumpkin. In this letter, Lumpkin writes that she's been sick ever since Peggy Mock went missing, and she later relays that Peggy went to Texas in the trunk of a car. Since we don't have the full letter, it's difficult to know in what context these pieces of information were written. Was Lumpkin saying she was worried about Peggy going missing because that meant someone was out there hunting local women, or did she write it because she knew what had happened or perhaps suspected she may have known who was involved? Writing that Peggy went to Texas in the trunk of a car certainly grabs attention, but we also have to consider that that was a very popular rumor around the time of her disappearance. Whether or not there are any truth or facts to base it all on, we simply don't know. And with Lumpkin gone, there's no ability to ask her what she was talking about. Being that this letter was sent to an unnamed third party who ultimately turned it over to police, I can't help but wonder if the recipient had any information to give them about why Lumpkin may have been writing about Peggy. In a bitter twist of fate, Judy Lumpkin herself becomes the victim of a homicide two years after Peggy vanishes. In her case, the two men responsible are caught and sentenced. Police had hoped there might be a link there. Perhaps Judy was killed because she talked about Peggy. Or maybe one of those killers may have been involved in her case as well. As it turned out, the killers admitted that they were drunk and out of control that night, and one of them went over the edge and began killing. In all of the years that have passed, no one has managed to successfully link the murder of Judy Lumpkin to the disappearance of Peggy Reeves Mock. Before wrapping up here, I wanted to take a moment to address the lack of information in this case. I utilized every resource I have and I could barely scratch the surface of both the case and Peggy's life. Alabama has in the past been a state where I truly struggle to find information. For reasons I can't explain, some states are much harder to work with than others. I didn't receive anything outside of generic messages when I asked law enforcement questions. I couldn't get access to the files, and tracking down Peggy's remaining family members has proven difficult. Those I did reach out to never got back to me, either because they don't want to discuss it, they don't have helpful information, or the contact information I was given was out of date or inaccurate. So, I'd like to make a request. If you worked on this case, had knowledge of the investigation, knew Peggy, were present in either of the bars that night, or are in any other way connected to the area, Peggy, or her disappearance, please reach out to me. I'd really love to flesh out Peggy's story, to fill in missing details of her past, and to hopefully compile additional information about the case and frame it in a brighter light. I know there are a lot of people out there with information, be it related to the crime or Peggy herself. Drop me an email, message me on social media, if you'd like to remain anonymous or talk off the record, I am more than happy to accommodate you. I make these requests because honestly, without someone coming forward, new information to fill in the background or someone to look into, the vanishing of Peggy Reeves' mock will remain open, unsolved, and very cold.
If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Peggy Reeves Mock, there's honestly not a lot to find out there. For this episode, both the Gadsden Times and the Birmingham Post-Herald contain the most detailed information about the case. If you have any information about the vanishing of Peggy Reeves Mock, please contact the Boaz Police Department at 256-593-6812. Her case number is MP0193. 006. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Butram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Fabulous TT, Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkowitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes our look into the vanishing of Peggy Reeves Mock. Once again, I would like to ask, if you knew Peggy, if you know the case, if you have any information that can help fill in some of the blanks, please reach out to me. As for now, that ends this week's episode, and I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.